Sound good? So we are now recording and admit. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, so I want to I want to tell you about uh, well towards anti-racist pedagogy in first semester physics and when it's towards it's moving towards and frankly um, it's yeah it's a steady steady journey and I'm going to be talking in the context of physics 70 a class that I I've taught many many times over the years and I started teaching again four years ago and. And I'm going to be talking about Physics 70 in the context of a GISP that some of our students did that led to a mandatory SNC marking in that course. Uh, then I will tell you something about anti-racist pedagogy. This will be a short introduction to it, but an introduction that I hope uh, lets you see that it's inclusive pedagogy or begins to let you see that. And then also defines four characteristics of it that I want to use as I just as I show you examples of changes that I've made in physics 70 to try to make it more inclusive. So when I get to those changes, I'm going to I'm going to first start with a timeline to give some context to the changes and kind of show you the range of the changes and what was behind them. And then I'll show you three different examples uh, of, of things that I did. And I, I found it very useful uh recently to start thinking about these three changes and what and what they meant um to how i thought about the course and how i talked about the course with the students and and the first one is you can learn this and then the next one which happened later was it's all about you um, and then the next one was we see you and then finally i'm going to wrap up with the with the fact that i am with you and I need to be with you in this in this particular work. It's a critical part of it. Um, okay, and let me do this. Okay, nice. And so I want to tell you about a GISP. There were four physics students among I think a group of ten or eleven total students. They were Abby, Abby, Amy, Dan, and Jamel. They were. Uh, three of them were seniors and one, I, I believe, was either a sophomore or a junior at the time. They had all taken Physics 70. And they did this GISP, which they called Race and Gender um, in the Science Community. And what they had done was they, they noticed what was going on around them. They noticed that there were fewer women's, women and, and, and people from underrepresented groups uh, in physics, in other STEM classes as well. And they wanted to get to the bottom of it. In addition, it was clear that they had experienced things within the department and seen things that they were trying to make some sense of. And so they put together this GISP in which they looked at research that had to do with these types of issues. Uh, they looked at books, they brought in guest speakers, uh, some of them are actually in the Zoom call um, and thought about it, worked on it, and then created interventions. So when, when you do when you do a GISP, you know, there's often final projects, and they had final projects which were interventions. One of the interventions was a presentation to the uh, Faculty of Physics where they told the faculty of physics about what they learned. Another one was an intervention uh, very specifically for physics 70, a class that all four of the physics students had taken before. It was clearly important to them. Uh, Professor Chung Yi Tan made space in that class for them to use class time for this particular intervention. And so I sat in the back and Chung Yi was there. And what we heard was the research they did. They looked at the data. They looked at the studies. They asked the question, is there some reason, some reason that women and people from underrepresented groups are not doing STEM? Are they not interested? Do they not have the ability? What could it be? And they looked at the data and concluded that the answer to those questions were, uh -uh. 
it's something else. And so they started thinking about interventions they could do based on the reading they'd been doing to kind of make things better at Brown, to make things more inclusive. Um, they created a course actually that persisted, uh, that this course has been offered at least two or three times since they left Brown. It's not offered as a GISP, it's actually done by um, uh, faculty members. I'm sorry, I need to admit people. Um, okay. Um, okay, and I do wanna just go back to the, to the fact that mechanics, the intro to mechanics course, this physics 70 course was a place where they first started uh, feeling social dynamics that actually uh, were discouraging uh, for, for people who are on the margins of the community. And so it was not surprising that, in fact, they wound up making some suggestions to the department. One of the suggestions was to make the climate better in Physics 70. And I don't know if they actually said this part out loud, but they might have encouraged the department to consider mandatory SNC. Whether they did that or not, uh, Manakshi Narayan, who was chair of our DIAF committee, took a hold of that as an issue and encouraged our curriculum committee to seriously consider it. The idea was that in this first semester, it would be helpful to make the climate less competitive, less stressful for the students. We could see just in our building that Engine 30 did the same thing. And schools like MIT did the same thing with their physics classes. If it can work there, then it could work in our physics department. So the curriculum committee led by Bob Pelkovitz um, did this great poll where they polled Physics 70 alumni, alumni who had stayed in physics, that is physics concentrations, and ones who had moved on to other concentrations. In that poll, revealed that two thirds of students who had been in Physics 70 thought it was a great idea for improving the course. So I was excited to learn, I, I came off being chair and having not taught for six years that I was gonna get to be the first instructor of, of Physics 70 in its mandatory SNC form. I was scared out of my mind. Um, I had spoken with many students in my office one-on-one -on -one over the years and found out how hard the first four semesters can be for some students to try to find a community, uh, you know, as a physics student, finding study groups uh, that they could trust. Um, so anyway, I just want to tell you, I'll tell you about changes that I started to make or modifications to kind of adjust for mandatory SNC and to kind of make the course more inclusive. Um, but we did poll midway through that first semester about whether or not mandatory SNC was working. And the poll was pretty clear, I thought. 69% of the people said that it actually enhances their learning in the course. 21% said it makes no difference. And then 10% said it distracts from their learning. These were incredibly encouraging results. So encouraging that we actually asked the next question, do you want the next class mandatory SNC? but I don't want to go there. They said yes, okay. They really liked it. Um, there were qualitative comments that come with this survey that I share with you. Uh, I think they're really important and they're the kinds of things that we as instructors love to hear. For me, it is much easier to learn when I can relax a little bit about how a problem will be graded and think more slowly and deliberately about how I can understand it and solve it. And then the second part of the second one was what it has been good for is creating a cooperative, lower stress environment in which we are free to engage with others and make mistakes along the way. Um, there, were good re there was a good response rate. So I kind of really trusted this survey and the qualitative comments were really wonderful to see. I have recently in the last year and a half started to learn about anti-racism. Um, there were certain texts that I looked at. I'll show you one of them in just a second. Um, and then I started learning about anti-racist pedagogy. Uh, and I feel very confident in saying that our department's choice to make Physics 70 grading mandatory SNC was anti-racist. It was a step that was anti-racist. And I want to explain to you what I mean by that. But first, I'm going to tell you about a little bit about anti-racist pedagogy 
and kind of the yardsticks I use to actually begin to make such a statement. So how I learned first about anti-racism was by reading this book, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, there are wonderful talks by Kendi on, on the web and I found the book to be really engaging and wonderful. Um, and one of the very essential points is in the quote above, that the opposite of racist isn't not racist, it is anti-racist. Um, it's a very important, uh, it's, it's a very important difference. Um, it actually implies that the opposite of racist is trying to do something that dismantles or modifies practices that you find out are racist. To move it toward pedagogy, thank you very much, Sheridan Center folks. Um, they, they sent out a statement in their newsletter, which, has, which I, I took this quote from it, which I find very helpful. We define anti-racist teaching as intentional syllabus design, intentional, I will return to that word later, as intentional syllabus design, class content or pedagogy that creates or develops racial equity with applications for face-to-face -face and remote hybrid teaching environments. So you can maybe tell a little bit about how recently this was made. This, this development uh, or this emergence of, of anti-racist pedagogy uh, on a university campus like Brown, for many of us is very new. Um, it's only a year and a half old. There is a field of anti-racist, about anti-racism um, that has been, has existed, I think, for years. And I am going to use, I'm going to draw upon some of that literature to actually create a framework for looking at uh, what you might do to courses, how you might modify courses to make them uh, more anti-racist. And so I'm gonna talk about very specific changes that I've made to Physics 70, and I'm gonna talk about them in the, in, within the context of anti-racist pedagogy and inclusive pedagogy. I'm gonna be drawing on the work of somebody named uh, Kate Kishimoto, um, and I can, oh, well, this is actually a reference and I'm, Happy to help you get references after this talk. I'm sorry I don't have links on the slides or anything like that. Okay, yes. And so to begin, oh, that's more than I wanna do. There are four characteristics of anti-racist pedagogy that I was, I was able to distill from a very rich article written by Kishimoto. I think they capture the spirit. Um, I've, I've spoken with, with Mary Wright and worked with Mary Wright on these as well. Um, I actually do one further distillation by turning them into phrases and, I, and because that way I can kind of hang on to them and use them and then get centered around them. So the first one, and there are four, is providing context, provides uh, anti-racist anti pedagogy provides socio-political historical and economical context to the development of a discipline. It doesn't look at things as apolitical, ahistorical and neutral, a, a society, it doesn't do that. It provides context for whatever it's doing. Um, another thing it does is it decenters authority in the classroom. Uh, students um, share maybe in the development of assignments. Students make choices about assignments they might do or assessments, how would they be assessed? Um, it also encourages students to make connections to and see themselves as part of the topics being discussed. I even look at that more broadly, seeing as part of the field of topics that are being discussed. So in that sense, uh, anti-racist pedagogy embeds learners. It embeds learners in the space. And then the final thing has to do with community. Um, Anti-racist pedagogy encourages, builds a trusting space where everyone is invested in learning together. And the class hopefully becomes a community where people are helping one another with the coursework and then they become interested in, in the larger humanity of the people around them. So let's look at mandatory S and C grading. Uh, 
in, in this context. And I see at least three of these characteristics arising in it. The first one is that it decenters authority in the classroom. The comments that the students wrote about relaxing, relaxing and thinking more about the physics. I've heard other students say that, well, I chose to work on that homework problem more because I found it harder and more interesting. And I didn't worry about getting the other one done. It allowed me to make a choice that actually um, let me learn what I felt like I needed to learn at the time. Um, it also embeds the learners in the space. By taking away um, that competitive atmosphere, by making it clear that there are multiple paths to, uh, to be successful in a physics class, because there's not only, you don't just have to aspire to an A, you're, you're able, you have this extra space to think about what it is you wanna do and to try it on, to, try, to take risks. That tends to embed the learners. And then there was that quote, which just spoke right to this. Um, it decreased the competitive atmosphere. Um, that competitive atmosphere is real. I would suggest that most of the people on this Zoom call, please forgive me if I insult you by saying this, have a little bit of a competitive thing going on inside. It rears its head at different times. It's there, it's this natural thing. It can get in the way of things and it can certainly get in the way of learning as many of our students had kind of felt over the years. So I got Physics 70 and it's mandatory SNC. And it became a very interesting thing for me to think about to try to, um, to make this work. I had never taught a mandatory satisfactory no credit course before. I was concerned about how I would keep students engaged through the course. I could easily imagine and I don't consider this the better part of myself when I imagine this, students saying, oh, it's just mandatory SNC, I'll let it slide. I don't have to spend much time on it. I could imagine that. So I really wanted to encourage the students to stay engaged. Um, I also needed to help them figure out what constituted progress and success in the course. Students aren't used to thinking about SNC. All of them are coming from high schools where they got all A's. In fact, they were at the top of their class and everybody was telling them they were getting every, you know, they were the best physicists they'd ever seen. So I needed to help them assess their pro progress through this course using grading or scoring that was different from what they'd seen before. And I needed to be clear about that. I also needed to be clear with those scores because they needed to know that they could go to the next course and expect to be successful if they did the right things, things maybe they'd learned to do in Physics 70. And then also it was necessary that whatever these modifications were, they needed to align with our greater curriculum. Um, there are situational factors. You know, Physics 70 is a class that has used a very specific text. And we've chosen that text because, well, I've heard it from many people. It helps people see what it's like to think like a physicist. There is something about the way this is done for physicists of my generation, at least, where we look at it and say, oh, this, these problems are interesting. I can see how students begin to adore principles of conservation of momentum, conservation of energy to solve problems, to unlock the world. So to align modifications with the curriculum, I had to keep the text. I kept the homework sets of the beloved problems and I had to use exams. That's how our students are assessed in later courses. They need to get used to those. Um, the exams can be modified, but, but that's an important skill that they need to develop. Um, so it, to meet one and two, um, I started drawing upon effective pedagogy that I'd seen used in the, de the department that I learned about through Sheridan Center things. And I used things that I knew in 2016, 2017. Back then I was thinking about effective pedagogy and active learning was on my radar screen in some ways. Over the course of the time that I've had Physics 70, uh, the word I put in front of pedagogy 
um, has changed kind of from effective to inclusive, to transparent, to significant, to now anti-racist. And I want to tell you about the changes that I've made, the modifications I've made to the course over this course of this time. And first of all, I want to tell you how grateful I am that you're here and I get to give this presentation because it has helped me kind of gel some of these ideas and lay them out in ways that I would not have been able to do otherwise. And let me take you through the timeline to maybe show you how that was helpful to me. So we started with mandatory SNC. I wanted students to keep up with the work. I wanted them to constantly be finding out how they are doing. Um, David Lowe had done some just-in-time teaching earlier. That is where you give reading quizzes the night before, and then you adjust what you're going to do in the classroom based on how they do on those quizzes. I liked that concept, and it seemed like one which would keep the students working up to speed with the course and would start the conversation for each class because I know they would have seen something already and shared the experience of trying to solve some problems on it. I carried forward uh, problem solving conferences that uh, Minakshi pushed for in Physics 30 and 40 um, that Humphrey Maris and Bob Pelkov has truly championed uh, in Physics 70 and taught me the value of. And then there was this American, Associ American Association of American Universities uh, grant that I, that, um, that I was the PI with, with Dave Targan. So I'm truly Dave Targan and Jim Dallas with Dave Targan, um, where we did more work with problem solving workshops and conferences. There are things that can build community. There are things where you allow students, give students the chance to put their hands on the material in a space where they can get feedback, which is immediate on how they're doing. The second year that I had the class, um, thank you, Gong. We got undergraduate TAs. Gong made a very a big step in granting us undergraduate TAs. Undergraduate TAs have been effective across campus, CS certainly, and in other departments. Our students have said that having TAs, which are not too far away from them in experience, uh, helps build community uh, in the course and also helps them get explanations that aren't so distant as the ones that uh, ex very, very expert instructors sometimes give. It's a nice alternative. At this time, I, I went to an institute at the Sheraton Center that Stacy Lawrence uh, co-ran with Mark Lowe, his, who's departed from Brown University. Um, they call this Pischetti, which meant a lot to me given given how I used to say the word spaghetti when I was a child, the Problem Solving Course Design Institute. I will elaborate more on this as one of the major examples that I wanna tell you about that I, that I put into um, Physics 70. It's a way to explode problems that we love into a form that gives students kind of more agency with them and a richer context for, for, for engaging with them. Uh, in the following year, in the summer, I guess in a June, I went to a four-day workshop called TILT. And the first T has to do with trans transparent. And transparent instruction and learning transformation workshop or something. I, I, I can't remember, but I love the workshop. And in that workshop, I learned about uh, learner-centered syllabus design. And I will talk about that one later as well. Um, this past summer, there were two Sprint students, former Physics 70 students, who added to the, the battery of scaffolded problems that we could offer to the Phys Physics 70 students. It was great to work with two alumni of the class in developing those scaffolded problems. I felt like, I felt like the way that they were motivated uh, was better than how I could do it um, because they were closer to it. Oh, this past summer, many of you know about the Anchor Institute. That also informed me even more about learner-centered syllabus design and how to do that. Oh, and then finally this year, um, I started using writing assignments uh, and sharing those assignments. And I'll talk about those ones also. Um, 
I started learning about those things through the Anchor Institute for sure. And then through, through being one of the facilitators for the seminar on the trans, on transforming uh, anti-racist teaching, on the transformation of anti-racist teaching, which is done with the Sheridan Center, with Mary Wright, Eric Caldor, Stacey Lawrence, and with Monica Linden and Patricia Sobral. Uh, Monica is in, in neuroscience and Patricia is in Portuguese, Portuguese and Brazilian studies. So this is a timeline. Um, there's this evolutionary quality to it that I will come back to. So let me go to the first example and scaffolded problems. And I put, you can learn to do this. And I hope that becomes clear why I say that. Um, so here's physics 70. And here's a nice rugby ball, somebody with a brown rugby shirt. And they were twirling the ball. So this is the rotational part of the course. So um, it's true that problem solving is critical to learning in physics. We, we say this all the time to our students. I, they will say it back to us. Um, persistence in problem solving requires feeling that you're making progress on pro problems, that you're learning things. And not only that, you value the problem you're solving. During the pandemic, this has often been done in isolation. And even pre-pandemic, we frequently isolate ourselves when we're solving problems, or students do. That's not great for community, and it's maybe, well, it's maybe not the best way to be learning. Um, and so the approach to kind of combat this, to maybe provide alternatives to this, are to create exercises that have rich context, they're scaffolded, and they include self-assessment along the way. Now, one of the things that we, we deal with um, when students come to Brown to do physics, uh, when people come around you as a physicist, there's this perception that has developed that you have to be brilliant to do physics. It's the brilliance problem. And I've heard many of you talk about it before. So there is, there is Uncle Albert, um, iconic, E equals MC squared, right? That's all it takes. I mean, clearly that was just a single thought for Uncle Albert. Um, do we have to be that brilliant to do physics? And, and so sometimes the way we state problems may reinforce kind of that, that perception or that need to be brilliant to do it. So here is one of actually my favorite problems from, from Kleppner and Kalenko. It's favorite because of what I realized that it can help students learn um, not for the example. So it's a device called a capstan. I did not know what a capstan was until I read Kleppner and Kalenko. And I didn't have the internet at the time, so it took me a while to find out what a capstan actually was. Um, you wrap a rope around it. And what's great about it is the rope on one end can have a substantially different tension than the rope on the other. If you wanna pull up an anchor, you're gonna need great tension in the rope um, but, but you can't handle that tension with, with somebody just holding it. So you wrap that rope around the post and, and use that, use the friction of the post to keep the, the, the rope from sliding. And then you can actually pull up the anchor. Again, the reason that I really liked this problem was it develops an important skill for the students. And this is one of the first times they get to create a differential equation. Differential equations are so important in physics. They're important in a whole lot of fields, in fact. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so here's the original statement of the problem. This is the task that our students are asked to do. By going to, Pischetti, to the Pischetti workshop, I learned ways to transform this problem, to scaffold it, to kind of give it more context and to kind of enrich the learning experience for the students. I will tell you, I watched some, very, some of the students who were best prepared for Physics 70 work on this problem prior to my putting any scaffolding in it and seeing them kind of get to the end and fudging their answers without kind of not knowing what it is they learned along the journey. 
So I was really excited to get a chance to try to think about maybe how to scaffold this so they knew more about what it was they were doing. Now, what I'm showing you here is a structure, which is a triangle. And so the idea of this triangle is that when you pose a problem like this, when I pose an activity, propose an activity like this, I want to be thinking about the purpose of the activity. I want to be thinking about what it is I want them to be doing. And I want them to know what they need to do to be successful. I want them to be even be able to decide whether or not they've been uh, successful. I would even like them to be able to decide whether or not their answer actually makes sense. So this capstan, if you look at it a little bit more, you can see that this problem is just like the problem of, of how many times do you wrap dental floss around your finger so it doesn't slide when you floss your teeth. It's the same problem as how many times you need to wrap a guitar string around one of the pegs so that you can tune it without the string slipping. It's the same physics. So we talk about that physics kind of in the, in the purpose of the problem. I'll show that in a moment. So, um, good, I've, yes, yes, yes. And so the goal of scaffolding is to help students solve complex problems by showing them how they can break them down into parts to really demonstrate that. And then, and then also by giving it this context is to help them appreciate there's a great diversity of, of reasons that people need or want to learn physics. Um, there's a, physics is very general in what it can actually uh, help you understand. So I would write a purpose. So now this problem has gotten this much longer. There's this purpose that tells students, okay, this is like flossing your teeth or tuning a guitar. Oh, even more than that, it's gonna tell you how to use differential equations. And it's gonna tell you in the purpose that if you learn how to make differential equations or recognize them, you're gonna do better in your next physics classes because you're gonna need them there. Well, and not only that, maybe you can go work on Wall Street and do some modeling with differential equations or, or, or model neuron, neuron signals uh, using differential equations. There are all these possibilities for folks. Oh, wow, okay. Scaffolded, now the scaffolding, this, this was the statement of the problem. Now there are 10 different parts to the problem. It's a step-by-step it's a -step guide to getting through this problem. It looks, and I was fearful of this, as though, oh my gosh, if you put this many steps in there, well, they're just gonna kind of walk up the steps and get to the answer and learn nothing along the way. And I can tell you from listening to them talk about these problems as they're doing them, they get stuck on different steps. And sometimes they get stuck on a step because of an earlier step. And they start talking to one another about the specific steps. So it really helps them focus on things and concepts that are, that are important to physicists um, when you make a differential equation. What does theta plus delta theta mean? You know, I need the tension of theta plus delta theta. I need the tension of, oh, I need tension of theta also. I need it pulling in both directions. Conversations like that begin to happen. Um, so, so far we've scaffolded seven problems. Uh, I collaborate with sprint students to do that. These problems account for 15% of the course points in the class. So I treat them, they are very important. Um, and I feel like the students really learn from them and they learn these scaffolding skills and then they're doing other homework problems where they can apply those skills um, and approach these problems kind of with more confidence, the ones that don't have the scaffolding. In the future, I wanna talk about the brilliance perception explicitly. Um, I haven't done that yet. I haven't, I haven't had the courage to do that in a strange way. I'll get back to that much later in the talk. So scaffolded problems. If I look at those in the context of anti-racist pedagogy, um, I can see many overlaps. They embed the learners into the space by giving that rich context. It decenters authority. They can do these kinds of things and learn them on their own to some degree. Um, and I have seen it build community. It actually makes the conversations richer 
uh, and kind of more pointed that they have with their classmates. Oh, and then there is this context. Uh, it's not sociopolitical, historical, or economical, but it does allow you to see how physics, the physics of the capstan can enter musicians' lives. It can enter dental hygienists' lives or our lives for that matter. And, and then, and sailors. So now I wanna tell you, tell you about the next example. Um, this is an old friend uh, I knew about Smokey uh, when I was a child. There were many posters of Smokey. And I want you for a moment just to look at this poster. I kind of modified it. People can prevent wildfires. I thought about this on the car ride in today. And I try to understand why, you know, Madison Avenue or whoever made this, you know, made it only you can prevent wildfires. And I realized that qualitatively I felt different about those two. People can prevent wildfires. At that point, I start picturing people with axes and hoses and shovels going in to fight wildfires. Uh, I don't do that. Um, but, but the moment they made it only you, it became clear to me that, yeah, no, I, I do that. Or I start picturing myself doing that, whatever it is, uh, preventing wildfires. Uh, so I'm going to start talking about syllabus redesign and, and putting it around the phrase, it, it's about you. Um, and this I learned in the TILT workshop, the Rhode Island Teaching and Learning Course Design Institute uh, in 2019. And a lot of the work that was done in that institute came from somebody named L.D. Fink. And this is a book, uh, Creating Significant Learning Experiences, which has many of um, many of the ideas I'm going to talk about kind of rounded out and shown with examples. I, I, I found it a very readable book. Um, so in 20, 2009, uh, I taught Physics 70. That was the year before, the, that was my last year of teaching before I stopped teaching for six years. And this was what the introduction or the description of the course looked like um, for Physics 70. And so I might ask you to just give it a look and I was used to writing my syllabus statements like this. I was used to seeing them like this. In fact, uh, when I was in college, they had much less than this. Um, after going to that workshop, um, this, this is how I, I wrote this introduction. And um, I found one of the things I wanted to do was to create rich context at the same time as being clear about what it was that they were going to learn. Now there's more to the syllabus that actually lays out more details about what it is they're going to learn. One of the biggest steps I had to take uh, personally, which, which, which was just striking to me, was changing to the use of you in the syllabus. I used to write students will extend their capacity to mathematically account for the motion. I, I felt like somehow or another that was less intrusive. I'm not quite sure what I was thinking. Um, it was like for some other student maybe that wasn't the student reading this. I, I wasn't quite clear. There was a real barrier to me making this change because it actually felt like I can't tell you how it felt. If, yeah, I can tell you how it felt. It felt like I was doing something wrong, that somehow or another uh, I was going against my own physics experience. Once I made the change to you, a lot of things started to follow for me in terms of understanding why I would provide rich context for various things. So you are going to learn things. You are going to do things. The syllabus is littered with things like that. You will know you are successful when you look at your scores in this particular way, oh, provided the scores are saying what means successful. It made it much more learner-centered. I, I couldn't avoid thinking of individual learners once I started to say you. 
So there was this structure for modifying a, a course. Um, and you, now you're seeing this triangle again. This, is, is, this was purpose. This was tasks. This was criteria. It's the same structure, slightly different names. But if you're writing a, a, a syllabus, this is very, it's a very helpful um, structure. Oh, wrong way. Fink came up with a taxonomy of significant learning. What makes for significant learning? Um, if you have learning outcomes that teach students about how to apply the information they're learning, you give them foundational knowledge for the discipline. You show them how it maybe integrates or give them opportunities to integrate how it fits with chemistry or with their math class or with what they're doing at home or their outlook on the world. Um, oh gosh, yeah. There's caring in here. You actually help them to appreciate or you encourage them to begin to feel about the material. Appreciate the power of conservation principles. That would be a caring statement. You, you get them to learn how to learn. All these things can be done as, 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 as significant learning outcomes. And you can then be, you can also begin to, to bring in the human dimension. What can this do for the world? What does this do for me in the world? So writing um, course objectives with those in mind, course objectives that maybe the collection of them actually touch upon all pieces of this particular pie really help you center the learner in the course. And so let me, let me just talk about two of the learning objectives in the class. And these are ones that, that definitely start out uh, with things that I was used to seeing. You're gonna use calculus, vector analysis, coordinate system transformations, numerical tech, dugga, 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 to describe a range of mechanical systems. This is mechanics. This is the mathematics that you apply to it to you understand it. Um, you're developing power here. So this is application. There's gonna be foundational knowledge here. The second one is understand and derive conservation principles that apply to natural phenomena. So again, this is an application. It's moving toward integration. Natural phenomena, there are natural phenomena that fall outside the realm of physics and beyond and develop an appreciation for their power in physics. This is the caring part. I really love seeing students who have, well, who tell me how much they like conservation of energy compared to kinematics. They really develop an appreciation for not having to remember, you know, uh, distance equals one half GT squared and initial conditions when they can just, just conserve uh, uh, energy to solve a problem. Um, here are two of the uh, two other learning objectives. One is uh, to learn how to articulate the relation of mechanics to other fields. This is integration and subfields of physics and communicate scientific concepts, ideas to others. This is the human dimension. It actually helps you also care about the material because you're thinking about your friends as you're talking to them about it. And then I added this one this year um, as I've started to learn more about anti-racist pedagogy. Appreciate that there is a great diversity in the motivations, worldviews, and approaches that influence folks pursuing the study of physics. And engaging with this diversity can enhance your learning. And we have assessments for that in the class. And I talk about that. And I will give you an example of some of those shortly. Um, when I think about this grid, these four characteristics for anti-racist pedagogy, I feel as though this entire wheel falls on it. It captures it all. The two are consonant, or they're consistent. I have to tell you, um, when we started, when I started thinking about anti-racist pedagogy, and I started talking with Monica Linden about it quite a bit, um, trying to understand what it was, what it could possibly be in STEM. We don't have content, which is specifically dealing with race and gender. However, 
what I've come to learn and come to appreciate, come to hear from one of my colleagues, Jim Gates, when he came to speak to the class, as he reiterated, science and physics occurs within a society and we can't shed any of that. What I am really thrilled about at this stage, but I'm still going on, I'll show you one more thing, is that this significant learning pedagogy aligns so well with anti-racist pedagogy. There was nothing to shed at this point, maybe just to reframe. So the, the next one, the next example before I work, you know, sum up is, is we see you. And this is using polling in class on exams, for assignments and for sharing. So this is an image of a Google Jamboard. Uh, I asked the class this question in the first day of class, what motivates you to take this physics course? And seeing it on a Jamboard just makes me that much more happy about seeing it. I, I'm gonna shut up for a moment so you can just spend some time looking at it. I know there are many physicists in the audience. I think I can safely say that some of you resonate with these statements. Um, so their first writing assignment, which was worth 10 points in the course, was to reflect on their motivation, either relative to the learning objectives or to motivations of your classmates. Um, doing this on the Jamboard allowed them to see the diversity of motivations uh, in the class. At the same time, it kind of built community because I think they found out <laughs> that, that there was a lot of overlap frequently in what they were saying. Um, and the one in German uh, is just priceless. Uh, on the last, the second midterm that I gave, I never, I never did this before. Um, um, I told them before the midterm that 10 out of 60 points would be based on them describing a problem that they solved or a demonstration that they saw in class since the previous midterm that was meaningful to their learning and why and how, it, it actually had how as well. And there were 82 students in the class. And I have to tell you, when I got these and categorized them, I was blown away by the number of distinct choices. I was blown away by how many things that they had engaged with. That was fantastic. But also um, the diversity and the things that actually mattered to their learning in ways that they personally had identified. I made sure to share this with the class as well. I wanted them to see it. And I also wanted to celebrate the fact that they had done so many things since the previous midterm. Um, this, these exercises, these writing things, um, to me, they clearly decenter authority. It, be, it comes down to what is inside them, what is meaningful to them in the learning, how do they do their learning. It certainly embeds the learners in the space, it builds community, and um, I think it provides context. Perhaps it's the context of the people in their community. Um, yeah. So this, this is my second to last slide, and I call this taking stock. <clears throat> so um, I've discussed practices that I was using in Physics 70 um, that I believe align with anti-racist pedagogy now that I've examined it more closely. Um, in the end, they occurred at different times, even before I knew what anti-racist pedagogy was. They were all motivated to improve pedagogy. And again, I had seen things in the department, things that my colleagues were doing I, and continue to do that are examples that truly fall within anti-racist pedagogy very clearly. Um, and this consonance, I, I find really exciting for progress in our department. Now, 
it is it is true that throughout this, I went from effective to inclusive to transparent to significant to now striving for anti-racist pedagogy. Um, I was adjusting my intentions for these practices uh, the entire way. And I guess I want to finish with um, the kind of the one element that I've, I've spoken about the least, which is actually very important or anti-racist pedagogy. And that is that intentions matter. The intentions of the instructor matter. Um, and how you're talking about why it is what you're doing um, lets the students know that you're with them. You're asking them to do things and they need to know why you're doing and that you're in it to win it with them. You're, you're with them. So I, re I return to the Sheridan Center newsletter sentence, which I find a very clear way of saying what anti-racist teaching is. And um, with that, I want to thank a lot of folks and, uh, and open for questions. And I'm sorry that this took so long because of technical problems and slow talking. Can we ask questions? Oh. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yes. Please ask okay. questions. All right. So, um, <laughs> so, so Jim, uh, it's uh, actually almost refreshing. It's very uh, surprising, but in a good way that in your whole seminar, you actually made very few direct mentions about the uh, pandemic. So I just wonder the, oh. the past year and the plus, right? This dramatic change we all had to face. Is it? like shaping your teaching in some angle, some in positive way, or more importantly, when we come out of the pandemic, when we return to more or less the good old way of teaching, would we have learned something during the pandemic that we could actually turn into a lasting positive change in combination um, with this anti-racist teaching? Yes, yes. Um, so, so Jay, thank you very much for bringing this up. I, I, I think the pandemic um, has, taught us all things that, that had been remarkable. Not the least of which was that it created the, it led to the Anchor Institute being creative, which, which I, I think talked about inclusive pedagogy um, in a way to many, many people, many more than before than people implemented them. Um, I, you know, the pandemic has made us very sensitive to the variations in personal situations uh, in a way that you know, when people are all in the same classroom, you know, it's, if it rains in the classroom, it rains on everybody. Um, if it floods in Texas, it doesn't flood on everybody in your class, but it floods on some people in your class. And so that individuality of the student, I, I think, started to come out much more clearly. Um, giving students the space, you know, these exams that we would give to students that would have more time, maybe be open book. Um, was it was a way that was actually adjusting for creating less stress for people taking exams and allowing them to maybe get their better work out because of it. Um, we had to think of a, a new range of assignments that we could give. And the more assignments, types of assignments, types of assessments, types of activities, uh, you give more and more opportunities for people to shine uh, in your class and show what they've learned. I am personally gonna miss some of the polling that Zoom allows, some of the shared activities like Jamboards, uh, because I think those types of, I, I wanna do those maybe as in-person discussions, but I can see a value in them. They were, that Jamboard I find really concrete. Um, you get to hear all the voices at once and I found out by doing that kind of polling that my idea of my predictions for what the voices would say would only cover five to 10% of the students. So did I answer your question? Yeah, good.
I'm happy to take any other questions. Sorry. Oh, I can stop sharing, I guess. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Hi, Jim. Uh, fantastic. Um, how do you see this um, change propagating further? Uh, namely, I mean, the, the introductory concentrators course is really a, a special you know place for, for for doing this great stuff um uh and yeah but it's not only the value of including people in the introductory course and, and get you know making physics uh, more available to you know everyone um any racist and so and so forth, uh, but it's also because <laughs> it's it's better teaching. So, how do we get this? Uh, are there some natural things that can propagate into the upper division courses? That's that's a wonderful question, Dave. And so, Dave, can I answer your question by? And I'll do my best to be as even-handed about it as possible, although it's it's becoming less less problematic right now. There are many things that happen in our department right now. There have been many changes uh, that have been made, things that people do, which are, that fall within anti-racist pedagogy. Let me just give you a few of them. Um, and, and, and you know them, Dave. When students start talking to, no, no, no. When students start talking to you about a class that's working for them and you hear stuff, if you listen to them, you can, you can hear these things. Dima, is known for his stories about history. And those stories connect to physics. And it matters to the students to hear recently how graduate students had been involved in the discovery of superconductivity and never recognized for it. You know, Dima tells those wonderful stories. In our curriculum, we have Physics 720 and Physics 1720. Um, Listening to students talk about that class, which Anastasia does an incredible bang up job with, they are getting empowered to be physicists. They are learning things that matter to them because they know they're gonna do a better job in physics 1510. They're gonna do a better job in quantum because they've learned the linear algebra and they've learned how to do the differential equations better. It's like, they're, they are embedded and they are getting further embedded and kind of empowered. Um, when we made those changes for physics 30 and 40 by adopting that textbook, those, those pre-class assignments, those animations, um, even, even the homeworks where students could get immediate feedback on their learning, you're actually really helping them. And it's, it's an anti-racist move that that flattens the space and makes everybody part of the space. And yeah, the, um, oh, I got more. I definitely have more. Give me a second. All the group problem solving work, every time we try to put a TA associated with a class, both undergraduate and graduate, we are helping. All those things are anti-racist steps. For progress, Dave, is this intention thing. If I can get myself to be clearer about my intentions, to be more comfortable in my skin as I talk about why I'm doing these things, if we all can, I, I believe we already have the fodder for doing it. It's a matter of being able to say that we're doing it for that reason. I think it's the most inclusive pedagogy I've learned about. Um, but I got to be clear about that with my students. Um, your sharing it is very important for the rest of us. So thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Dave.
Uh, hi, Jane. Hi, Don. Uh, uh, wonderful talk, and thank you for your effort in this project. Uh, I have a question. So you have used uh, lots of textbooks, right? Uh, some for introductory physics. Uh, how do you characterize uh, the, 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 the textbooks we have as a tool of our education and curriculum? Do you characterize them as neutral, uh, racist, or anti-racist? I think it's too early for them to be anti-racist. Um, and, and when I say that, um, that doesn't, <laughs> so, so it's for a textbook, you know, the opposite of, of racist is, can be neutral, <laughs> I think. Um, I don't know if it can, uh, can it has to be anti-racist. Um, I do think uh, that, that textbooks, yes, yes, they can be racist. They can be sexist. And the sexist part is very easy to see. Um, as a hundred men jumped off a flat car uh, <laughs> to, to, to put an impulse on it. Yeah, Monica's, well, you saw that you had the same textbook, didn't you, Monica? Uh, yeah. Um, so yes, they are. And um, the question is that I, that I deal with, Kleppner and Kalenko did so many things so, so well. What am I not seeing that's in it and in the approach that actually is affecting, is actually marginalizing people in the class? And it's a textbook that's been around a long time and I can believe that there are things in there that are doing that inherently, um, by maybe by omission, um, uh, maybe by the types of examples that are in there. Um, so the thing is, as, as you know, you know, we're a very textbook driven discipline for, for our curricula. Um, we tend to center our curricula as textbook. We, we tend to make textbook choices that define kind of the classes. And the, most of the, many of the textbooks have been derived along the line. You know, Halliday and Resnick, I don't know, we're up to 100th edition yet? I don't know, it's getting darn close. Um, and so I don't, I don't know if, if uh, they've been scrubbed or modified to kind of, they certainly have become more inclusive as I've seen them. So I think they're moving in the right direction. I'm sorry, that was maybe a, randomly, random, a rambling answer gone. Um, I hope that was That's helpful. good. Yeah, I mean, my own experience is uh, there are many minority uh, and women's contributions. Some of them are Nobel worthy, were not mentioned uh, in, in textbooks. Uh, and it always tends to be men, uh, sometimes, most of the time, white men, right? And I think textbooks uh, are, are, are an area that we should, we should focus on also. Yeah, yeah. Sarah agrees. Yeah, actually, if I could just leap onto that, there's, you know, even even the phrase thinking like a physicist, I think we should examine because physicists have been traditionally old white men. So what does it mean when we want our students to think like physicists? Are we trying to get them to assimilate into mm. uh, the dominant culture? Are there other questions? It's really great to see you all. And I appreciate uh, your, your audience. It's, um, uh, hey, Jim. Hi, Jay. Hey. Yeah, it, it was really nice to hear everything. And uh, but I, I just wanted to ask about, it seems more focused toward the uh, the introductory courses, of course, which is important, but like, for example, like the same issue can be like happen, like it can still be like races in like upper level courses, like graduate courses, for example. And it, it's a common thing for like us physics students to see how the number of women students 
uh, decreases as you go farther into like graduate school and mm. as you get higher mm. into senior level and so on. So like for let's say like graduate courses, for example, if you have anything and if, if you can do something similar in the sense of like what you've done for the introductory courses, or is there any <laughs> of trying of doing that currently? No, uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Jay. Um, so there, there are there. Let me let me point out some of the things that I've seen for the graduate courses that I you know move along those directions. One is one is right now we're trying TAs for some of the graduate courses now um, for for you know helping with homework and and you know there are discussions about that and seeing how that how well that works out. Um, you know, the mechanics class has an assignment where you can make a choice. You know, the final third of the course, you write a paper. Is that right? You have a project that you can do of your choosing. Is that correct, Jay? Yeah, I think it's just, I don't think it's a choice, but everyone just do a project. I don't know, maybe it was different. Oh, okay. But you can choose what project to do, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that, that is an anti-racist practice. Um, so providing more choice uh, allows people to put themselves out there and make a decision about what they want to do to learn because those projects are not easy. I mean, I've heard about some of these projects. And so people are really starting to challenge themselves and they're choosing a direction to do that in. And so that's a really great step. Um, yeah. Uh, I haven't taught a graduate course in a long time. And um, I... I believe that you can use anti-racist even practices in graduate courses, and I think they're coming. But but, um, and Jay, you know, I have talked about Physics seventy. You never took Physics seventy, so you have no idea how poorly I've done with this. Okay, um, I have made mis I had made mistakes. There are parts. There are things I've tried that haven't worked, um, and. Um, What I'm comfortable with is, is that I'm even more comfortable now. Now that I, I have this four characteristics that I can move toward and kind of evaluate things, I feel more confident in trying stuff. And that feels really good. And so if, if more of that is adopted and people feel more latitude, you know, I think we can all move toward it. Mm -hmm. Can, can I add a uh, continuous question about that? Absolutely. Like, it sounds like if, at least like you have been working on these things and like, if you teach a graduate course, like you will definitely like try to apply them. But like, mm -hmm. uh, I hope, like I hope every professor would do the same thing. But like, I know like every professors have different types of lecturing style and have their own philosophy and like, so some of them might not go along this way. So I don't know, like, will there be some kind of like collective effort toward this thing for every lecturer in the department eventually, hopefully, which I feel like should be like ending goal in some sense. I don't know, do you think yeah. like, um, that'd be like a viable thing? I uh, Jay, um, I, I don't I don't know how to answer that. I, th let me say the following, and I think this is important. Um, the uh, I, I have spent a lot of time on this over the last four years, relatively speaking, and um, and and I've had the latitude to have that time, and. Uh, what my hope is, is by talking about this and seeing practices. In fact, I don't know that we're so far away in a lot in in a lot of cases. Um, if if it it comes down to intention, I, and 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 I will I will tell you it's an uncomfortable intention for a white person who grew up the way I did. I will tell you, to getting to that attention is has been uncomfortable, um, and I still get uncomfortable. Um, 
there are biases that I'm constantly facing and uh, personal biases that, that emerge. And, um, and so uh, that's the best I could do answering that question. Let me tell you, look, oh God. Okay, go David, sorry. Um, this is something that I fear. Uh, uh, there's something that I fear about this, Jim. Okay. Which is that um, where before one could see the history of physics, Galileo, white man, Einstein, a white man, so many old white men in the history of physics, where before I felt and I could see it possible to understand that there was no difference between them and me, because I'm a person too and I'm an irrational being. Now I feel that we're being nudged towards thinking that we couldn't be them because there's some things that we cannot change about our looks that makes it, us be completely different from them. Uh, so I fear that we're devaluating some of our heritage by not underscoring the fact that we're all humans and that we have this rational mind, but rather that one of the things that we should look on first is, was this a white person who wrote this paper or was it this a man or a woman who came up with this theory? And um, I, fear, I fear some of that, that where before there was a whole throbe of things that we could all go into look now it's, well, you know, just the people that came from the place from where you came from. And I find that um, a little um, sad. And, and secondly, I, I think that some of this, not all of course, and uh, is also siding with some philosophies that are reactive to objective knowledge, specifically postmodernism. Um, and, and, and that's also something that I, that I feel some trepidation about. So I was wondering if you have some thoughts about that. Is that so, so first of all, thank you for saying all those things. Um, and uh, I have a limited capacity for some of, for some of these things. And so um, I, I think I, I got uh, the thread of what you were init initially saying. Um, that it sounds like there's a racial racialization of science and of evaluating work or or being aware of race maybe in an in inappropriate times as you open a paper is is that fair am i am i getting that right kind of uh that's part of it Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and um, I, would say, I would say that the the fact before and and this is something that that is a little dangerous about uh, Candice's uh, position about this, which is that there is no middle ground, and before now we had that middle ground in the sense that we're all humans, rational beings. If you show me the math and you show me the experiment, you're right. Doesn't matter your genes or your uh, the color of your skin none of that. So it is erasing the middle ground. And, and I thought before today that that's where science uh, had landed. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I understand um, better what you're saying. So um, I, I guess, uh, I, I, I feel differently about that. That's that's that what what needs to be acknowledged. In fact, is that science has not landed there. Um, that that there are still things happening that marginalize uh, women and people from historically underrepresented groups in STEM. This still happens. It still is still felt. It's still an influence, and um, you know. The numbers, we haven't moved the needle in terms of participation for decades. And I, 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 I can safely say learning through, living through some of those decades 
sitting in that middle space has been the place that we've been kind of collectively as a society in the US for a long time, like somehow or another, you know, there's, there's racist and not racist and I guess colorblind or something or, or neutral. Um, so so um, I, I understand what you're saying. So what, what I like about Kendi, what I like about Kendi's statement is that um, it's about dismantling racist things or structures or practices that you see. So if you see something, then you should take an action. And I see something. I guess I, I, I've seen, I feel like I've, I've seen something. And so it's important to kind of adopt this type of pedagogy. Um, yeah, so if, it, yeah. I'm trying to think of what the other thing you were talking about was, David, the second point you brought up. Uh, the, the attack from postmodernism, if we can call it that way, on, on objective reality, uh, truth, rationality, all that yeah. good stuff. Okay, so um, I, I can quickly get out of my depth in understanding what, what all those words mean. Um, if, if, I, if I try to make a connection to what's going on um, in, our, in our society, um, the fact that, that we could have a president that was talking about injecting bleach into their veins and not getting denounced um, started suggest to me that the objectivity of science was totally being questioned at a very fundamental level in the country. Um, and that's one level of that, uh, you know, uh, denouncing, if you will, the objectivity inherent in science. Um, the the, the objectivity about scientists and certainly in the classroom. Uh, so Jim Gates came and spoke with to my class for 20 minutes and told the students about his biography, but nothing about his research. One of, one of the powerful things that I felt he said to the group, which, which fell, you know, falls differently on different people in the class for sure was that science occurs in a society, in a social structure. And then he addressed the women and the students of color directly when he said, and society isn't fair. And he was saying, and if somebody tells you when you're feeling unfairness that it is fair, don't automatically believe them. It was, it was an amazing thing. It, it was a very uplifting talk completely. Um, but he said these things in a way that I could never have said to the students, um, that I've never felt as my students and as Professor Gates have felt. And um, when I hear things like that, I, I, uh, I feel like I have more work to do in the classroom. Yeah. Can I, do, do we have time for another comment? Yes, I yes mean, we do. And then I should- Maybe I someone to else to... has another question. So if, if, if they do, just go ahead. I'll, I'll chime in if that's not the case. Hit it, David. Yeah. Um, From every extraction that we have come from, Jim, including you, including myself, everybody, if we look back far enough in the history of humanity, there's, we're going to find someone that at some point had it really tough. Mm. Uh, every race has been slave, everyone, by everyone else. Uh, so there is a claim to, to uh, racial hurt from all of us, if we all look far, far enough into the past. I guess that there's some claim about, you know, time washing things away. Uh, 
but I think that being human and cognizant of our history makes us all be friends in trying to be um, as good as the defenders of justice as everybody else. So I think that we all have a right to speak about these things, independent of our race of, or our extraction. There's a lot of cloth to take from our history. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that I, I, I want to hear you talk about these things, James. I think that you have a right to it. And I also do, and everybody does. Um, um, yeah, so that's another thought and the final one. Okay, okay. So please, David, if I said anything that, that made you feel shut down, I apologize for that. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, I really appreciate this, everyone. That really was challenging, I'll tell you. And I appreciate that too. Um, I need to run to another meeting uh, and I should stop the recording too. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Stacy.